arrival at the White House for the state dinner of the President of the Ivory Coast, 7th of June, 1983. President and Mrs. Oufouet, Boignier, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's a special pleasure for me to welcome our guest of honor this evening. During the 1980 campaign, I suggested that the United States should return to some of the basics of free enterprise, policies that would encourage individual responsibility, hard work, and investment. It's taken time but we're at last overcoming the economic uncertainty that we inherited. Now, I'll have to admit, I've always been confident that we would. I just kept telling myself, it worked in Ivory Coast, didn't it? <laughs> Seriously, though, Mr. President, your many successes 
haven't gone unnoticed here in the United States. Unlike many other countries, some of which are far richer in natural resources, you chose the high road of political and economic freedom. In doing so, you've made Ivory Coast a shining example to the rest of Africa and the world. Mr. President, your wisdom has been a guiding light for your people and a beacon of reason and modernization in the world arena. You are a leader who stresses dialogue as a means of solving even the most vexing problems. You advocate compromise over confrontation, conciliation over conflict. Your humane and democratic values reflect well on the people of Ivory Coast. During our discussions today, we touched on many mutual areas of concern, especially those dealing with the promotion of economic growth. The President has been forced to make tough decisions concerning government spending. Well, I can identify with that. <laughs> and I deeply admire his far-sighted commitment to the long-range interest of his people. Today, we're confident that closeness and interaction between our two peoples can be nothing but a blessing for us all. So I ask you now to join me in a toast to President Pupwe Wanye and to the continued friendship between our two peoples that his visit attests to. Monsieur le Président, Madame Rian, permettez-moi tout d'abord de vous remercier pour la chaleur de votre accueil et pour toutes les attentions dont nous avons été entourés depuis notre arrivée. Je voudrais vous exprimez également notre gratitude pour votre aimable appréciation de la politique ivoirienne et pour avoir affirmé sans détour votre volonté de développer notre coopération. L'un de vos prédécesseurs a pu dire que l'histoire a confié aux États-Unis le rôle d'être soit le témoin de l'échec de la liberté, soit l'artisan de son triomphe. Je ne puis que souscrire à cette belle formule. Cependant, l'ampleur des engagements, l'immense responsabilité qui suppose fût pour la nation la plus puissante du monde, pouvait me faire craindre qu'en période de crise, alors surtout que sur votre propre sol, votre propre continent, aussi bien en Asie qu'au Moyen-Orient, des problèmes aussi inquiétants que délicats requièrent toute votre vigilance et celle de vos votre équipe, votre attention ne se soit détournée des affaires africaines moins pressantes. J'éprouve donc un très grand réconfort à constater votre détermination d'aider l'Afrique à retrouver la paix à conquérir une prospérité qui paraît désespérément toujours plus lointaine. Vous disiez le 13 février 1900, 
80, que état, les États-Unis ont l'obligation envers leurs citoyens et envers les peuples du monde de ne jamais permettre aux destructeurs de la liberté de régenter le, fut, le cours futur de l'existence humaine sur cette planète. Il n'y a pas d'opportunité mineure pour ces ennemis de la liberté qui trouvent dans la misère, dans l'ignorance, le meilleur aliment pour leurs funestes entreprises. Il importe donc de ne négliger aucun secteur politique, économique, social, culturel, aucun pays, aucune région, aucune société où puissent germer, se développer et exploser les conflits qu'ils suscitent ou qu'ils entretiennent. Et comme mieux vaut prévenir que guérir, il faut également veiller à ne pas laisser se perpétuer des situations d'injustice qui les favorisent. Certes, vous avez, Monsieur le Président, constamment mis l'accent sur la nécessité pour les individus comme pour les nations de prendre en main leurs problèmes, d'assumer leur avenir et de quitter la, la situation d'assister où certains se complaisent parfois. En Côte d'Ivoire, nous avons toujours demandé à nos concitoyens de ne compter avant tout que sur eux-mêmes. Pourtant, nul ne peut nier qu'il y a des individus et des nations handicapées qui ne peuvent sortir sans aide ou une aide prolongée de leur tragique situation. Nul ne peut non plus nier que le monde se trouve dans la situation absurde de gaspiller en armement de plus en plus coûteux des sommes auprès desquelles les crédits consacrés au développement sont dérisoires. Cette situation se trouve aggravée par la menace permanente d'insécurité qui oblige les pays en développement aux ressources très modestes, insuffisantes, à se battre à la fois sur deux fronts, le front du développement et le front de la sécurité, le premier étant trop souvent sacrifié au, pré, au second. C'est dire que ce que tous les pays en développement et singulièrement l'Afrique, ont le plus besoin, c'est la paix, dans la stabilité préalable à tout développement harmonieux. Vous, Américains du Nord, vous êtes les mieux placés pour apprécier les retards qu'accusent les pays qui ne connaissent pas de stabilité politique et qui deviennent de surcroît et de plus en plus de graves menaces pour la paix du monde. Le meilleur facteur de paix, c'est le bonheur des peuples. Paix et bonheur sont inséparables. L'Occident a les moyens pour aider efficacement l'Afrique. Mais cette aide serait vaine si nos efforts de production sont constamment ruinés par les spéculateurs. Certes, l'Afrique ne représente que 2%. Dans les échanges internationaux, c'est peu, nous en convenons. Mais c'est l'Afrique d'aujourd'hui. Ce n'est pas celle de demain, ni d'après-demain, que nous voulons bâtir avec l'Occident à partir de nos propres efforts. Nos potentialités sont grandes. Je voudrais citer le chef d'œuvre d'Alexis de Cotteville, 
intitulé de la, de la démocratie en Amérique. Il écrit en conclusion « Je me sens plein de crainte et plein d'espérance. Je vois de grands mots qu'on peut éviter ou restreindre. Je m'affermis de plus en plus dans cette croyance que pour être prospère et honnête, Il suffit encore aux nations démocratiques de le vouloir. C'est par ces mots que je voudrais terminer cette brève allocution en affirmant notre détermination, notre confiance aux nations démocratiques parmi lesquelles les États-Unis occupent la plus grande place, la première. Mesdames, Messieurs, je vous demande de lever votre verre en l'honneur de Monsieur le Président Ronald Reagan, de Madame Reagan, à qui je présente mes hommages les plus différents et les mieux choisis pour le bonheur et la prospérité du grand peuple américain et à notre amitié. Mr. President, Mrs. Reagan, allow me first of all to thank you for your warm welcome and for all the thoughtfulness that has been shown us since our arrival here. I should also like to express to you our sincere gratitude for your kind words describing Ivory Coast policies and for having affirmed so clearly your desire to develop our cooperation. One of your predecessors remarked that history has given the United States the role of being either a witness to the failure of freedom or the architect of its triumph. I can only subscribe to that fine thought. Yet the extent of your commitments, the immense responsibility they imply, even for the most powerful nation in the world, might have led me to fear that in a time of crisis, when especially in your own hemisphere, as well as in Asia, and the Middle East, problems as worrisome as they are sensitive require all of your vigilance and that of the team around you, I might have feared that your attention might have been diverted from the seemingly less pressing problems of Africa. It was therefore most reassuring for me to note your determination to help Africa to regain its peace and to achieve a prosperity that seems discouragingly ever more remote. You, Mr. President, said on February 13, 1980, that the United States has an obligation to its citizens and to the people of the world never to let those who would destroy freedom dictate the future course of human existence on our planet. There is no lack of opportunity for the enemies of freedom who find in poverty and ignorance the best fuel for their sinister designs. It is therefore important not to neglect any political, social, economic, educational, or cultural sector, any country, any region, any society, where there may develop and explode the kind of conflicts that the enemies of freedom provoke or sustain. And since prevention is better than cure, one must also be certain not to allow the perpetuation of unjust situations that foster them. To be sure, you, Mr. President, have consistently stressed the need for individuals, like nations, to take their problems into their own hands, to assume responsibility for their own future, and to cease, rely, cease to rely solely on assistance, as some at times are all too pleased to do. 
In Ivory Coast, we have always urged our fellow citizens to rely first and foremost on themselves. But no one can deny that there are individuals and there are nations that are handicapped and cannot emerge from their tragic situation without aid, extended aid. Nor can anyone deny that the wor world today finds itself in the absurd situation of wasting money on ever more costly weapons, sums of money which compared to which the, to compared to which the amounts of money that go for development assistance are pitifully small. And the situation is aggravated by the constant threat of insecurity which compels the developing nations that have modest, indeed even inadequate resources, to fight simultaneously on two fronts, the development front and the security front, with development too often having to be sacrificed for the sake of security. So what the developing countries, and Africa in particular, need most is peace instability the precondition for any harmonious development. You, the American people, are the best equipped to recognize the lack of progress of countries that do not enjoy political stability and which are becoming increasingly serious threats to world peace. The best factor for peace is the well-being, the happiness of peoples. Peace and well-being are inseparable. The West has the means to lend effective assistance to Africa, but that aid will be for naught if our own production efforts are constantly ruined by speculators. To be sure, Africa at present only accounts for 2% of world trade. That is not a great deal, we recognize that. But that is the Africa of today. It is not the Africa of tomorrow, the Africa of the future, the Africa we want to build with the West drawing on our own efforts. Our potential is great. I should like to quote here that masterpiece of Alexis de Tocqueville, Democracy in America. In his conclusion, he wrote, I am filled with fears and filled with hopes. I see great evils that can be avoided or contained, and I am becoming ever more firm in my conviction that in order to be honest and prosperous, the democratic nations have only to determine that they will be so. I could not conclude more fittingly, Mr. President, than by expressing our confidence in the democratic nations among which the United States holds the most important place. Ladies and gentlemen, I would ask you to please join with me in a toast to President Ronald Reagan and to Mrs. Reagan, to whom I present my most respectful and heartfelt compliments. And also to the happiness and to the prosperity of the great people of the United States and to the friendship between the United States and the Ivory Coast. Thank you.
We've got to stop meeting like that. <laughs> well, I think I speak for everyone here in expressing our appreciation to the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center. These fine musicians have been making their mark since 1969, not alone in New York, but national tour, television and radio, several successful albums, Kennedy Center, and since music stills the savage breast, I could even suggest several other buildings in Washington that you might play in from time to time. <laughs> and, uh, and also our thanks to Charles Wadsworth for his direction, his fine direction of these fine musicians. And again, thank all of you very much. It's been an enchanting evening.